Thanks, Lynn, for that introduction, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, organizing everything. My job here is to raise questions about what we mean when we use the word privacy. Although we often th throw around the words privacy and private, sorry, uh, with an assumption that we all know what the words mean, when scholars, governments, and courts attempt to define privacy, it becomes clear that it is much more slippery than first thought. From a host of different disciplinary perspectives, scholars have demonstrated that concepts of privacy are culturally contingent rather than natural, universal, or perduring. And even if we try to pin down what a modern Western definition of privacy might mean and how it might be protected through law, the difficulties multiply. My own thoughts on this began to crystallize in the winter of 2003 when I read an item in the New York Times referring to a legal case before the American courts. It told a story that immediately resonated with me as it resembled almost uncannily the kinds of stories told in legal cases in 15th century London about which I was then writing a book. Although the similarities were striking, ultimately it was the difference between the cases on the issue of the concept of privacy that was most revealing for me. First, a medieval story. In 1474, the Beadle, a lower level law enforcement official of the London ward of Farringdon Without, had reason to suspect that Joan Salmon and Walter Hayden, both unmarried, were alone together in a house. Accompanied by two neighbors, the Beadle approached the house. One of the neighbors stayed outside on the street guarding the doorway in case one of the miscreants tried to escape as the Beadle and the other man proceeded up the stairs to the bedchamber where the couple were rumored to be. In the chamber, Walter was found lying on the bed and Joan was standing beside it. Because they were found together in such suspicious circumstances, they were arrested and taken to the prison of the sheriffs of London. Such arrests were relatively routine in late medieval London. Beadles and constables were charged to enter a man's or a woman's house if word came to their ears that fornication, adultery, or similar infractions were taking place there. If a couple were found in suspicious circumstances, they were to be arrested and tried. A contrast that late medieval arrest for sexual misbehavior with the one I read about first in the New York Times in 2003, referring to a case that had taken place in 1998. Local police officers in Houston, Texas, entered the home of a man named John Lawrence after having been tipped by a neighbor who claimed to have seen an armed man behaving erratically outside of Lawrence's apartment. The officers entered the unlocked door of Lawrence's apartment, weapons drawn, and conducted a search. Although they found no man with a gun, they did find Lawrence in his bedroom having sex with another man named Tyrone Gardner. The officers arrested the two men, charging them under the Texas Homosexual Conduct Statute, which made, quote, deviate sexual intercourse a criminal offense. The two men spent the night in jail and later pleaded no contest to the charges, reserving the right to appeal, and were each fined $200. There are a number of striking similarities between the arrests of Salmon and Hayden in 1474 and Lawrence and Garner in 1998. Here, however, I would like to emphasize one of the differences. Lawrence and Garner appealed their conviction to the U.S. Supreme Court which rendered its judgment in 2003. The petitioner's appeal, based on their right to equal protection under the laws and their right to privacy, emphasized the unjustifiable invasion of Lawrence's private home. In its judgment, the Supreme Court concurred. It found that the laws under which Lawrence and Garner had been charged and convicted inappropriately targeted the most private human conduct, sexual behavior, and in the most private of places, the home. When anti-homosexual laws were repealed in many other Western countries in the 1960s and 1970s, the distinction between private spaces and public spaces was often invoked. As Canada's then Minister of Justice, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, famously quipped in 1967 
when he introduced criminal code amendments that decriminalized private consexual homosexual acts, quote, the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Having imbibed these assumptions that bedrooms and sex lives are private affairs from an early age, I was confronted with the realization that what I was seeing in my medieval English sources was an entirely different approach. In England in the later Middle Ages, the divorce between public and private that the modern liberal outlook assumes would have been totally foreign, especially in the realm of sexuality, which could never be conceptualized as a thoroughly private relationship in which the state or the church had no role. Joan and Walter could not claim that their right to privacy had been violated when the beadle and his companion broke into their chamber, because having such a right was conceptually unthinkable. We do not know how or if Joan and Walter defended themselves. They may simply have accepted the relatively light, if humiliating, penalty for a first offense, a night in the London Sheriff's Prison, and perhaps an hour or two on the pillory. Others caught in the act had few possibilities for defense. Most commonly, the couple could claim to be married, that their sexual relationship was a legitimate rather than an illegitimate one. But a medieval person could not claim that the sexual relationship, whether inside or outside marriage, was no one else's business because it was. There was no such thing as a private sexual relationship. It was either a publicly recognized appropriate relationship, marriage, or an inappropriate and illegal one, fornication, adultery, sodomy. The bedchamber was no more a protected private space for their sexual act than we would regard a bedroom as a protected space in which one could freely murder. As literature scholar Lena Cohen Orlin has recently argued, when scholars have examined the emergence of the modern Western concept of privacy in the 16th through 18th century, they have tended to assume that privacy must have been obviously desirable. That once people discovered the concept, they immediately moved as quickly as they could to create conditions where this desirable state could be nurtured. Much of modern scholars' investigation of this cultural concept has focused on changes in architecture, the new desire for privacy seemed to have manifested most obviously in new European styles of housing that created smaller rooms in which people could more frequently be alone to read, study, pray, and think, as in this Vermeer painting. Orlin has argued that this easy equation of smaller and more intimate rooms with a yearning for privacy is mistaken on several levels. First, as early modern sources themselves emphasize, privacy was as effectively and sometimes more effectively achieved, not in the small chambers, but in other spaces, especially out of doors in gardens or fields, or indoors in large rather than small rooms, in, especially in the new elite architectural fashion for long, narrow walking rooms called long galleries. Small rooms were not, in fact, so private. Eavesdroppers outside doors or through thin walls could undetected overhear conversations held in small rooms. Words or deeds heard and seen through chinks in walls or keyholes became, in fact, a cliche of early modern literature and litigation. A garden or a long gallery offered a paradoxically open opportunity for privacy. One could know whether anyone was near enough to overhear. The long gallery's privacy possibilities reveal also that scholars' assumptions about the obvious desirability of privacy are simple, similarly too simplistic. Is the desire to be alone with another person a natural and positive urge? Or is it a sign that the two people have something to hide? For 16th and 17th century English people, for instance, the, privacy, the private was as often associated with dangerous secrecy, contrary to the public good, as with a positive and desirable state. Orlin analyzes the Ridolfi plot, a conspiracy to overthrow Elizabeth I, showing that it was the conspirators' private conversations, always in galleries and gardens, that in the end incriminated them. 
their lack of openness and their desire to speak without being overheard raised vehement suspicion that in the end broke the plot. In the state's rhetorical response to the conspiracy, the plotter's search for privacy was equated with sedition and danger and contrasted with the honesty and openness that characterized a loyal subject of the queen. The ambiguity Orlin uncovers in the early modern English understanding of privacy resonates with our own sometimes unexamined ambiguity about privacy, especially after 9-11. Where do we draw the line between rightful privacy and dangerous secrecy? Is an insistence on the right to privacy a tacit admission that one has something to hide? Is our tolerance of intrusive airport searches of our luggage in person an appropriate price to pay for a more secure flight, even assuming that it does make the flight more secure? If we don't want someone reading our email, what do we think about monitoring the email of a suspected terrorist? Modern Western democracies have struggled with the issue of privacy, both before and after 9-11, not least because defining it is far from straightforward. Although it has often been seen in modern Western liberal discourse as a foundational right or freedom, it was included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, for instance, the definitional difficulties and vaguenesses that such a right to privacy could entail are at least partly responsible for its omission from both the American Bill of Rights and from the much more recent Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Both Canadian and American courts have in various ways nonetheless inferred a right to privacy from those documents, making possible, for instance, the decision in Lawrence versus Texas in 2003. The decision in Lawrence, however, highlights one of the more contradictory aspects of American and Canadian judicial decisions that rest on reading a right to privacy through other rights, which themselves often revolve around property rights. Although an American legal maxim repeated also in several Canadian court decisions related to privacy issues is that privacy must be accorded to people, not places. Nonetheless, privacy is almost always conceptualized in spatial territorial terms in judicial decisions. As the decision in Lawrence versus Texas put it, the Texas homosexual conduct statute was unconstitutional because it criminalized sex in the most private of places, the home. The crucial point in the end was that the sex was taking place in a private space, the space where as Trudeau put it, the state has no place. The emphasis in privacy decisions in Anglo-American common law on place and property has created a number of ambiguities. Feminist critiques of liberal concepts of privacy have highlighted, for instance, how defining the home as a private space outside the reach of the state has, in some cases, resulted in reluctance on the part of public authorities to prosecute domestic abuse. And it has also left other aspects of privacy, informational privacy, for instance, ineffectively protected by law and jurisprudence. Spatially, the internet, for instance, is both everywhere and nowhere, rather than territorially bounded. Privacy is a rich and multivalent cultural concept, but its very richness also makes it complicated to define and use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was, I think, a very interesting overview of the way notions of privacy um, have changed historically in relation to domestic public space. Um, and I think that's a very provoking reference at the end to the internet because it kind of opens up uh, a whole new bag of tricks that ha has really been uh, discussed quite a bit in the earlier sessions. Did you want to say anything more um, about the internet aspects of it? Well, I think that um, one of the things that, you know, I'm a medieval historian, so this is my, my kind of take on it from as a, as a lay person, is that 
is that privacy issues which had focused so much in the, 20, the second half of the 20th century up until 2003 with Lawrence on issues relating to sexuality, that that had been the, the sort of focus of much of the privacy um, law issues and that really though since the rise of the internet um, we have begun to, to in a sense shift over I think more to issues related to information rather than the, the conduct of sexual conduct and those other sorts of things.